It's time to accelerate. Hi, I'm your host, Andy Paul. Join me as I host conversations with the leading experts in sales, marketing, sales automation, sales process, leadership, management, training, coaching, any resource that I believe to help you accelerate the growth of your sales, your business, and most importantly, you. Hello, and welcome to Accelerate. I'm excited to talk with my guest today. Joining me is Julie Thomas. Julie is the author of Value Selling, Driving Up Sales, One Conversation at a Time, and the CEO of Value Selling Associates. Julie, welcome to Accelerate. Thank you, Andy. It's a privilege to talk to you in in your following today. I appreciate the opportunity. Wow. Pleasure to have you here. So take a minute first and introduce yourself. I mean, how'd you get your start in sales? Well, very interesting. So I... uh, I've been at this for a little while. My first job out of college, I was actually in finance. I got some advice from my late stepfather when I was in college that said, you know, you really need a business degree. And my favorite course at the time, my freshman year in college, was economics. Mm -hmm. And he said, if you like economics, you should really transfer to the business school and get a degree in finance, which was really uh, some of the best advice that he ever gave me. And so I transferred to the business school, got my degree in finance, and then with an undergraduate in accounting, and then immediately got recruited into a finance position out of college. Hated it. Hated every minute of it. (laughs) So Um, the good advice notwithstanding, the career choice wasn't what you wanted. It was not what I wanted. So I ended up um, uh, leaving that job and found a job uh, working in uh, as an inside inside sales professional at the time, and this is back in the late '80s. And I was an inside sales professional. And the business model for the company that I worked for was we were partnered with outside salespeople. So I was responsible for renewing the existing accounts that the outside salesperson had brought in, mm-hmm. and then upselling and uncovering new opportunities within that account. I did that for about one year and was had the highest retention rate and the highest upsell rate, rate so immediately got promoted at the time into a field sales position. Now, what was the product? I worked for a company called Gartner Group. We were oh, yeah. selling... Um, IT research and yes. advisory services, and at the time I was partnered with an outside rep who was selling to major account vendors. So uh, the accounts were HP and Apple and Sun Microsystems. It was a uh, 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 about a half dozen accounts uh, in Silicon Valley. Was successful with that and moved into be a major account rep. Then um, at the age of twenty seven. Um, supporting some of our Gartner's largest accounts in Boston. And I had, none of these accounts exist anymore. I, I don't think it's because of me. I think it's in spite of me. <laughs> well, no, but tell I us had, who they were and we'll see if they, you had anything to do with it. <laughs> they were DEC and oh. Prime and Data General. I used to refer to my territory as the not-for-profit mini computer vendors. <laughs> and, um, and I worked in that territory for four years. And as part of uh, being in that uh, territory as an account manager, Gartner had invested in this product called the value selling framework. And I was trained in value selling. And quite frankly, Andy, value selling was the reason that my career at Gartner took off. I was there for 16 years, one year in inside sales, four years in outside sales, and then sales, sales management, um, and ended up in uh, global sales training and professional development. And we used, at the time, value selling, the value selling framework to train and onboard all of our salespeople, inside salespeople as well as outside salespeople. Mm -hmm. And uh, so fast forward 16 years after I joined Value Selling, I was – Re, had been relocated to uh, the San Diego area, and okay, I chose. Okay, so so you went from Gartner to working for Value Selling. Yeah, well, I I left uh, Gartner and approached Value Selling, thinking, "Gosh, I I know Value Selling. I've used Value Selling. I've taught Value Selling. I've managed Value Selling." And what happened was, uh, when I approached the founder of the company, I found out that he was looking for his exit strategy. And this was back in 2003. Mm -hmm. So with my husband's full support, uh, we put a plan together and actually acquired Value Selling Associates from the founder 
who went off to retire. And that was in 2003. And I have been um, at the helm of value selling ever since um, through our global expansion um, and uh, new product releases and continue to do that. So the analogy that I use, and you may remember this, some of some of us that are of uh, I think I know uh, what you're generation say. is is uh, there used to be a the guy, razor commercial, yes. the razor commercial. And, <laughs> I knew and, you were going to say that. And his name was was Victor, and he, he loved his Gillette razor so much that he went and um, I think it was Gillette. Well, it was, no, it was a Remington Electric. Remington, Remington Electric, yes. and he so he loved his product so much he bought the company. Bought so the I company. loved value selling so much I bought the company and have been managing it since 2003. Excellent. Well, okay, great story. All right, so let's start digging into value selling. So, so what what is value in sales? Because this is in danger of becoming one of the most overused, least understood <laughs> terms in sales, and everyone throws it around pretty carelessly. So, to you, you've been in selling, you know, the value based selling for a long time. What what is value in sales? At the simplest level, Andy. Let's keep value, it simple because you're talking to me. Absolutely. At the simplest level, value selling and selling value is does the salesperson know how the prospect or customer will answer the question, is it worth it? Is it worth the investment you're asking me to make in your product or service? And if you understand, how the prospect's going to answer that because it's it's pretty simple. Either they're going to say, no, it's not worth it, or yes, it is worth it. If you understand how they're going to answer that question and the answer's positive, then you have somehow established value in that prospect's mind. The critical component of value is knowing that every customer is going to answer that question differently. And so the key to value selling is how does the sales rep engage, not profess a value proposition, but engage the prospect to facilitate a positive response to that question? Yes, it is worth the investment, the time, the effort, the energy, the risk of making a change and doing business with you. All right, so let's let's just make sure we go back and you know, reiterate what that question is again for people listening. So say it again. So the question was, make sure the sales rep understands how the buyer is going to answer the question. Is it worth it? Is it worth it? Is it worth it? Anytime you're asking somebody to make a purchasing decision, at some point, either consciously or unconsciously, the person who's going to make that decision is answering the question, is it worth it? And you and I both know that we go through that, either consciously or unconsciously, when we make consumer-based buying decisions. You know, somebody's going to buy a high-end, fancy-schmancy car, um, and somebody else is going to say, you know what, all I need is is a a low-budget car that will get me from point A to B. How they answer the question, is it worth it, is very different to them. And salespeople need to to understand how to do that. The interesting thing is value has two components. We primarily work with business-to-business sales. So at some point in time, everybody has to to understand the value is, is it worth it to the business? Can we build a case? Can we justify this decision, this purchase in the context of what the return will be to the business? Based but on what the, the investment has to be, yes. Absolutely. Is there ROI? Is there payback? Is there cost savings? Is this going to enable us to open up new markets and you know go places that we haven't gone before, shorten our development cost, shorten our waste, whatever that might be? Um, but the second component to value is always, always the um, the value to the individual. Does this align to the individual's personal value? Because personal value will outweigh business value every time. Things with ROI don't get bought every day because an executive has decided or a decision maker has decided something else is more important to him or her 
personally. Doesn't mean it's a bad business decision. It just means that in when resources are limited, I have to make the best decisions not only for the company but for me as well. Okay. So, and you say that takes precedence? Yeah, personal value will outweigh we believe business value every time. And there's tons of research coming out in neuromarketing and neuroscience that says people will not make a decision, a a purchasing decision, if they believe that it is not in their individual best interest. It's, It's why you never could sell outsourcing of the IT organization to the CIO. You had to sell it to the CFO because the CIO had too much vested in maintaining the organization from that perspective. So so understanding what's in it for the individual and connecting to that motivation is just as important as helping that individual build the business case to make the purchase decision. Yeah, and I, I, to me, I, all right, I get it. I mean, that doesn't doesn't conflict with anything I think I I I would understand um, or believe because I think that that purchase decisions are fundamentally emotionally driven and someone looking out for their own best interest is really that's not a very logical or rational decision but it's a very emotional decision I mean they may think it's rational but it's really being driven by their emotions so yeah that that makes sense we we would agree with that as a matter of fact one of our fundamental principles is people make emotional buying decisions for logical reasons. Yes. And once they have aligned with that personal value, they'll work their tail off to build the business case to Behind justify it. what yep. they already want to do. Oh, yeah. I agree 100%. <laughs> Actually, I was just uh, on another interview. I was just talking to someone about this, and and I just uh, read something recently about a, a researcher that had was working with people who had had some uh, a damage to part of their brain in a, yeah, accidents or whatever that that prevented them from feeling emotion, and what <laughs> what they found in studying these people is that they had almost an impossible time making any decision. So even the most mundane, routine decisions like what to eat for lunch are being driven by emotions. And a lot of salespeople just don't understand that it starts with the emotions. You know, they do brain scans as you. I'm sure no of people that are you know, in the motion or in the decision making uh, phase of things, and based on how their brain activates, it starts with emotions. It always starts with emotions, and you know, people, whatever that emotion is, it's exciting, it's it's um, it, it, it's sad, it's it's. I like it's you. The, I hate you. I. You it's know. the confidence, right? There's yeah. if if you don't like the salesperson that's representing the company either on the phone or sitting in front of you, it doesn't matter what their product is. You just want to get out of the meeting. So, Which is an interesting thing because you know, there's, there's a lot of people that talk these days about ah, relationships just don't matter. It doesn't matter if the prospect or the buyer likes you or not. And the fact is, I think people get confused. Is, is the relationship you have with your buyers is, is not a, you know, a personal one. It's, it's, you know, it's, but it's still a relationship. There's still a that like factor comes in. They don't necessarily like you like, you know, hey, I want to go out and have a drink with you, but they still have to have that fundamental connection. Well, you know, that's interesting. You know, it's an interesting comment because we work with organizations that are selling, you know, typically bigger ticket items that the the business to business salesperson Mm -hmm. is not going away for that. But at the lower end of the market, if they've got a part of their offering where they do think they can do away with sales and just automate the procurement process for the client. So if I sell something that really doesn't need to be sold, but I just want to make it easier for you to buy, think about what companies are doing. They are trying to humanize their websites to make them as easy to interact with as possible. And, you know, if I buy something from Amazon.com, it'll offer ideas to me. People who bought this also bought that. And almost try to facilitate a conversation and suggestions from a website. So so when you go into that, I, I'm not going to sell anymore. I'm just going to let people buy. Now the challenge becomes how do you make the relationship with the technology as likable as possible? <laughs> well, I think the challenge is even more than that, though. I think the challenge is, is that once you decide that you can automate your sales process cont- almost completely from start to finish, 
as you said, maybe a company on you know, one of their product lines or whatever. Basically, what you're saying is, yeah, this product's a commodity. Agreed. This Agreed. product's a commodity because not- there's because there's nothing of value that the sales reps could be able to help you with that's going to change or influence your purchase decision. So if, therefore, we're just going to be able to automate the whole thing. And at that point, you're like a pencil. Right, pencils. You don't need any value in your channel. It's all based on price and convenience and delivery. And you're just admitting at that point that that particular product, once you completely automate it, it's just a commodity and it's going to be interchangeable with anything else that's out there. Uh, agreed. And and then you try to create loyalty so that you can charge a penny more. Yeah. Good luck. Yeah. Exactly. But no, agreed. And and those are not typically the companies that we're working with. We are still working with companies that are selling something that's a big decision for their buyers. It, it often um, is difficult to differentiate their product or service given the vast amount of alternatives facing buyers today. So they need salespeople to really go in and create the need for the differentiation and explain that to you know, not just a single decision maker in many cases, but a multitude of decision makers who may be looking at the need from different perspectives. Well, in that case, though, the the sales rep becomes the first aspect of differentiation. Absolutely. How the salesperson engages with that prospect is part of the differentiating experience because it's not just the product or service itself. It's the whole experience of buying that contributes to whether or not somebody wants to pick you. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. All right. So I want to spend a few minutes talking about your your value selling framework. You've got eight steps in it. And I thought we'd just sort of browse through a few of them here while we have time. And so um, first one is always qualify the prospect. So Interesting. There's a lot of discussion. I've I've written about this, and some people violently disagreed with me. Whereas I believe I said you can't qualify the prospect on value unless you're willing to talk about price, because how can they make the decision about whether it's worth it if they don't know what the investment is? And some people just like go nonlinear about that. What's your thoughts? Well, I I think a couple of things. Number one. One of the things that I believe wholeheartedly is 90% of the time, the prospect knows more about our price than the sales rep knows about the potential value they can bring to the customer in the context that the customer believes. So we believe that value is part of that qualification. It is absolutely a dimension of qualification. But if the, the answer to value is, is it worth it, I need to understand the value versus the price and how the customer weighs that decision. Exactly. If I've got a million dollar headache and I'm your prospect, Andy, your hundred thousand dollar aspirin might look really, really good to me. Um, yeah, I think for I, sales if, reps, if, if, if a sales rep came to me or those that were working for me, it said, yeah, this is, this is qualified. I said, well, okay, but you know, as the customer, you know, you reach that, what I call a tentative agreement with the prospect that, that the value they're going to receive for the investment is worth it, then most times I said no. <laughs> to your point, right? Is the reps just didn't understand what the value to be able to make that that qualification. Well, and what happens is often is the sales rep sees it clearly. Oh, this is a no-brainer. This is a piece of cake. The cost of this is obvious to me that if they if they move from this you know, this one business process to a SaaS or a cloud-based process, then, you know, their savings is going to be so much more. But if the customer doesn't see that the same way or they see the risk associated with change is greater than the reward, you're not going to win. So we believe that that becomes a very deliberate conversation that the sales rep has to have with the customer. No assumptions are going to get you there. You need to actually facilitate and have that conversation. And in order to have a value conversation, Andy, it doesn't just become about your technology. You need to understand how that technology is going to impact the business. So the first thing that we teach sales reps is no matter what you sell, human resources uh, services, uh, business services, some sort of a technology, if you only talk about 
the technical aspects and the technical problems you solve, you will never be able to have a value conversation. You need to talk about what's going on in the business that creates need for that technical solution because not all problems, not all pain is worth addressing. Yeah, well, and this, this value conversation, as you talk about, is, is this is coming back to where some of the emotion comes back into sales because at some point, I don't, I'm not a big believer in that we qualify, we qualify against a pain point. I think you qualify against aspirations and objectives because that's where the real value is, right? I mean, it's, it's well, much, more, think, of a, much yeah. more of a positive and upside. It's, I don't think people make change necessarily in big and a broad scale, at least it hasn't been my experience, to fix a pain points to achieve something. And so yeah. understanding and being aligned with that objective is really important. And that, that gets back to this emotional aspect of sales. Absolutely. So we teach that qualification has four dimensions. One of them is value. One of them is need. And, and that need is not only a technical need based on whatever you're selling, but it's a business need. It, it, it's more complex and has multi-dimensions to it than just finding the pain. And then the third one is power because we see a lot of lost deals happening because the salesperson finds out that they are selling to someone who can't buy. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, that happens, you know, happens a lot. It happens a lot. And, uh, and, and so it, you can't have the value conversation if you're not talking to the right person who has the authority and the ability to actually make the, the procurement decision. And or it's somebody that has, world, has responsibility for what that value ultimately ends up being, right? Who cares absolutely. most about what that value has to be? Absolutely. And, and in today's world, that's, you know, that is more and more people in the boat, more consensus-driven decisions, uh, more committee, task force, because a lot of companies have found that is a way to mitigate their risk of a bad decision of making sure more and more people are involved in that decision-making process. And then timeline. What's the plan? What's the plan for them to get the value? So we teach them to use timelines in the sales process as a way to motivate and create urgency by focusing on value realization, not just on getting the order. Because if I've done this right, then me closing the order is just a step to you getting the value. So it, we kind of upend that sales process and focus on value, not on procurement. Yeah, I think that value realization is really a critical point uh, that that's so often so often overlooked. I mean, uh, there's a great quote that I have in my latest book from uh, Jeffrey Colvin, who wrote um, Talent is Overrated. And, and in this book, he talks about the ability to, and this is paraphrasing, his ability to quickly gather information to make good decisions is becoming a key competitive advantage for companies. So, the ability to get through their process so they can get to the value realization stage more quickly is really important. You know, they don't, companies don't set out to spend a year to make a decision on something. They could spend six months making a decision on it if you, as a seller, were helping them make that decision more quickly. Yeah, and, and mitigate their risk that they're making a bad decision. mitigate their risk, right, but also that they get the value more quickly Absolutely. out of it. I mean, that's, yeah. why they're, that's why they're there. And that seems to be a part. So, tell why do you think that salespeople miss that part so frequently? Is that that the customer has an incentive to make a faster decision? In fact, the research is showing. I mean, IDC and others have studied this. At least in the B two B space, people want to make faster decisions. Well, I think a couple of things. I think you know. Uh, Many sales reps aren't focused on that value realization because they haven't taken the time to figure out what the value is. And so they, they confuse knowing their value proposition with understanding how the customer is going to measure the value in their situation. Mm-hmm. And so if you don't know what the value is, you can't, and, and when they expect to achieve it, you can't use that to create a timeline that says, hey, if you want to see this impact your business by the fourth quarter of 2016, and we're sitting here in mid-June or the beginning of June in 
2016, you've got to make a decision in the next 30 days or everything's going to be at risk for the end of the year. And if you haven't taken the time to have a conversation about that and understand that, you can't build that timeline to focus on value realization. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's just a miss from many salespeople. And quite frankly, it's because of the heavy pressure. When is it going to close? When is it going to close? I think VP and sales should be asking the question, when does the customer need the result? And therefore, when is it going to close? And if they start asking that question a little bit differently, sales rep might get a little bit better at answering the question in a way that will create the urgency and motivate them to take action. Right. And I think the key thing there that you talked about is the result, the outcome. The outcome isn't they bought our service and they've implemented it. The outcome is they've bought our service, implemented it, and are now receiving the value that they expected they were going to receive based on that investment. And that is one of the key components of the value selling that we teach salespeople how to do that during your sales process, not only to improve your forecast accuracy, but to improve your ability to adequately and fully qualify. Because timing is always one of the keys that gets in the way of them taking action for whatever reason. Do I know the timing of the customer beyond making a decision? Yeah, no, very, very important. Very important. Well, good. Come to the last segment of the show where I've got some standard questions I ask all my guests. And uh, the first one is a hypothetical scenario. And in this scenario, you, Julie Thomas, have just been hired to be vice president of sales of a company whose (laughs) sales have just flatlined. And the CEO and the board are really anxious for you to come on and start turning things around pretty quickly. So, in that line, what two things would you do your first week on the job that could have the biggest impact? Well, the, the first thing I would do would be to meet with all the stakeholders, specifically the managers, to diagnose why flatline sales is a symptom of something. And it's very difficult to prescribe what the right solution will be to before you diagnose. So I would go into a rigorous, quick assessment and diagnosis of process, people, um, potentially compensation, and, and some of the key pillars that would drive sales. The second thing I would do would be to make sure that I had the board in the boat with me with a prescribed set of solution and an agreed upon timeline to turn it around so that I was clear on what their expectations were and I was working a plan with them with key milestones to make sure that we, once we had diagnosed those problems, we had a prescriptive solution in place and however much time it was going to take to do that, that I had their buy into that early on and wasn't surprised that they expected to turn around in 30 days when I thought it would take 90. (laughs) Or six months or whatever, right. Manage up, manage down. All right. Manage up, manage down. Good. Okay. So now I've got some sort of rapid fire questions. You can give me one word answers or elaborate if you wish. So the first one is when you, Julie Thomas, are out selling yourself. I mean, when you're out selling personally, what's your most powerful sales attribute? I think it's my confidence and my experience that our program, not only have I used it and it's worked, I still use it and it works. And I am just so confident that if I sit down with a VP of sales, Um, that we can impact their business and impact their careers with the success of value selling, that that becomes contagious. Okay. Next question. Who's your sales role model? My sales role model. um, Interestingly enough, I I grew up with uh, my father being in sales and sales manager. Mm -hmm. And while he sold something very different than I sell today, I think I learned a lot on his work ethic and his relationship building skills. He worked in an industry where he got to do, his customers became his greatest friends. Okay. What did he sell? He sold boxes, corrugated boxes. And and they did a lot of entertaining in that industry. Mm -hmm. And he had... Uh, phenomenal relationships that the relationship decommoditized his product. Yeah. Except today it's all commoditized, I'm sure. (laughs) He's retired. (laughs) Yeah. So uh, next question is, so other than your own, what's one book every salesperson should read? Other than my own, let's see. Um, 
You know, one of the books that I really enjoyed um, reading was a book. It was when I first came to become a sales manager, and it was called Everyone's a Coach, and it was written by Ken Blanchard and Don Shula. Mm -hmm. And it was a great book that helped me understand how to leverage coaching as a sales manager. Yeah, great. That's the first time somebody's mentioned that one. Excellent. Okay. And then last question is, uh, what, what music's on your playlist these days? Oh, my goodness. Well, I just went and saw Billy Joel a couple weeks ago, so I've been mm-hmm. listening to him. Um, but I'm also a, a country girl at heart, so I've got a lot of the pop country uh, on my playlist right now. Such as? Uh, Brad Paisley, okay. um, uh, Kenny Chesney, Carrie Underwood, songs like, you know, Garth. artists like that. Well, Garth stuff. Brooks, too. An old Garth. Oh, Garth Brooks, yeah. <laughs> Always like Garth Brooks. All right. So, well, great. Julie, well, thank you for being on the show today. And tell people how they can find out more about you. Please uh, visit valueselling.com or feel free to call me directly or contact me directly. Uh, Valueselling.com is our website. My email is julie at valueselling.com. We're on LinkedIn. We're on Facebook. uh, And we would really love to hear from you and see if we might be able to partner with you and your organization. All right. Well, great. Well, thanks again. Thank you, Andy. I appreciate the opportunity. And remember, friends, make it a part of your day every day to deliberately learn something new to help you accelerate your success. And an easy way to do that is to make this podcast accelerate a part of your daily routine, whether you listen on your commute, in the gym, or as part of your morning sales meeting. That way, you won't miss any of my conversations with top business experts like my guest today, Julie Thomas, who shared her expertise about how to accelerate the growth of your business. So thanks for joining me. Until next time, this is Andy Paul. Good selling, everyone. Thanks for listening to the show. If you like what you heard and want to make sure you don't miss any upcoming episodes, please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or Stitcher.com. For more information about today's guests, visit my website at andypaul.com. 